a giant table um, sort of being built out of much smaller tables is exactly what's going on um, in Jolt and, you know, with, with Lasso um, from the viewpoint of calling things tables. Okay. But um, uh, if you, there's another perspective, which I actually prefer, and I kind of only use the lookup table view because the community uh, was using it, you know, before we wrote Lasso. Um, the perspective is the following. Um, let's say you have um, two uh, computer scientists call them bit vectors, um, and you want to uh, compute their bitwise XOR. So what that means is, you know, each vector is a bunch of zeros and ones, and you know, uh, you go, you know, you, you look at the first bit of each of them, and you know, if they're if they're both one or both zero, you spit out zero. Uh, but if one of them was one and one of the, the other is zero, you spit out one, and you want to do that bit by bit. Um, so on on you know modern computers, uh, the bit vectors have length about sixty four. Um, so that means, you know, uh, 64 for 64 bits, you're looking at, you know, two bits <laughs> and you're saying, you know, are, are they both zero, both one or, or not? Okay. Um, and, uh, this whole decomposability property of the giant table into smaller tables, what that, uh, turns into in the context of this bitwise XOR operation is the following. Um, so rather than handling all, uh, you know, uh, 128 bits at once, you know, 64 bits in, in each of the two vectors, Instead, we can um, break each vector into chunks, say eight bit chunks, that's one byte chunks. And we compute the, uh, to, you know, to get the bitwise XOR of all 64 bits, you can compute the bitwise XOR of each eight bit chunk and just concatenate the results together. Okay. And that's, that's the sort of, that, that's the decomposability property that LAS is exploiting. Okay. That you can take these two 64 bit vectors, break them up into smaller chunks operate on each chunk individually and sort of glue the results together to get the, you know, results of the, the whole operation. That's what Lasso is exploiting. And there were already Lasso and Jolt, and there were, there are already snarks today and ZKVMs even that exploited things like that. Okay. But, um, because Lasso and Jolt uses some check protocol, um, the process of doing the lookups into the small tables, which is equivalent to operating on each small chunk, um, of the input to the instruction is faster for the prover and the process of gluing the results together, you know, the, the results uh, for each chunk into, into a single result for the whole computation is also much faster. Um, and so you just get better performance for the prover. Um, and uh, I think they can handle like more general kinds of gluing together procedures and things like that, which we actually do exploit for some of the RISC-V instructions. Um, and so again, I think one of the reasons people have been so slow to recognize the performance benefits of the sum check protocol is like, you can build all these things without the subject protocol. It's just slower for the prover, right? So people were already doing similar -ish things, um, not with exactly the same viewpoint. Um, and it's just more expensive for the prover as we're seeing with the release of Jolt, where there's a lot more optimization still to be done. And it's already the fastest CKVM to date. Prior to Risk Zero and now SP1 and, and Jolt, um, all ZKVMs targeted, um, they, I, I cooked up instruction sets. So that is, Snark designers uh, designed their own simple CPUs where they chose the primitive instructions to be ostensibly friendly to the Snark proving machinery. Okay. Now, in my view, this has multiple downsides. Like this is just absolutely the wrong decision. Okay. Uh, for so here are the reasons. So um, I think Jolt uh, actually shows that this decision is bad for performance. So they, they made this decision because they thought it would lead to faster provers uh, bec because, you know, they chose the instructions to be, you know, friendly to the proof machinery. Um, you know, Jolt supports RISC-V and even more generally, like any instruction set where the primitive instructions have this natural decomposability or like chunkability property we discussed before. And like, I think like, you know, most natural instruction sets, uh, you know, uh, that chunkability property seems to be roughly like what what makes instructions good for real machines to run. So, you know, um, that that broadly speaking tells you that instructions good for real machines should also be good for snarks, right? And so people have been designing, quote, snark-friendly instruction sets. Uh, they've really been designing them to be friendly to today's like limited snarks. Um, they're artificial limitations. They're not actual limitations. So they did this for performance motivations, I think it's actually bad for performance. But on top of that, it's also bad for the developer experience and for auditability and usability and all this stuff. Because, you know, if you use an existing instruction set like RISC-V, 
we, you know, the computer architecture community has created all sorts of tooling around that instruction set, compilers from high level languages, you know, down to risk five, you know, hopefully they brought, you know, some formal verification tooling to bear on those compilers. If you have a new instruction set, like not only are you going to have to do a lot of compiler work uh, just to, you know, have your compiler, you know, spit out decently performative assembly code for your, you know, new custom instruction set. But, um, you know, you're going to need new tooling to uh, make sure that compiler is correct because any bug in the compiler is going to lead to potentially catastrophic vulnerabilities, you know, in the, you know, uh, settings where the proof system is applied and all, all sorts of things. So I think it's it's doubly bad or triply bad, you know, for developer experience, you know, for, for you know, uh, verification and, you know, uh, and safety and auditability. And then finally, it's, it's actually bad for performance, too. <laughs> um, so, you know, people were doing this for performance reasons. I don't even think it helps performance. The current implementation uses uh, a polynomial commitment scheme. You know, that is the, it's the only cryptographic part of the protocol, really, um, uh, based on what's called elliptic curve cryptography. And um, elliptic curves uh, need to work over what people call big fields. This just means that the numbers arising in the protocol are really big. Um, so writing down each of those numbers takes up to say 256 bits. Um, so it's just like, you know, each number arising is like a really, really big number. It takes a lot of, you know, bits, uh, a lot of zeros and ones to even, you know, uh, tell the, the protocol what number we're, we're talking about here. And so operating on those numbers, you know, people think it's, it's slow. Um, and, uh, protocols that like snarks that do not use elliptic curve based commitment schemes, um, they tend to use, uh, the cryptography they tend to use instead is, is, is hash functions only. Um, they're sort of free to work over smaller fields, keep all the numbers arising in the protocol much smaller. And it's, you know, uh, for each of those numbers, it's like much faster to add or multiply two small numbers than, than two big numbers. Um, and. So it sounds very plausible, right? Like keep the numbers small and everything should be faster. Okay. Um, and so there, there's this very widespread view that, um, you know, you for performance reasons, you should avoid elliptic curve-based commitment schemes. Um, so this view is largely wrong. I would say to the extent that it's right, it's right for different reasons um, than people think it's, <laughs> think it's right. Um, and I, Jolt demonstrates that because it's the fastest ZKVM to date, and it uses the curve-based commitment scheme today. Now, I, I do think we'll we'll get an even faster version of Jolt by moving away from curve-based commitment schemes, but the commitment schemes we're going to move to are different than the than the ones people use today. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think you can take the commitment schemes people use today and and make Jolt any faster than it is today. Um, and so, what one thing people are missing here um, is that uh, is the following. So, um, again, the, the deployed snarks today that people kind of draw all of their conclusions about performance from, they don't use the subject protocol. And for performance, you should use the subject protocol. And uh, the way I think of it, uh, of snark prover performance is the following. In snarks, the prover commits to a bunch of data um, and then proves that the committed data is well-formed. Okay, so um, that means that, you know, the 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 data... Um, satisfies all the properties it's supposed to satisfy if the prover is honest. Okay, and so the the situation is that the more data you have to commit to, the slower it is to compute the commitment to that data, and also the slower it is to prove that the data is well formed. Okay, the key power of the sum check protocol is that it reduces the amount of data that the prover commits to. Okay, which which has two benefits. One is the computing the commitment is faster, and the other is um, proving that the committed data is well formed is faster. Okay, now all of the commitment schemes people that are most popular today, and the two most popular ones are called um, Fry and KZG. KZG uses elliptic curves, and so people think Fry is really fast because it doesn't use elliptic curves. Um, they are targeted at, uh, you know, in the guts, they're targeted at what are called univariate polynomials, but the subject protocol needs to use multivariate polynomials. Okay, what that means is the uh, commitment schemes people use today um, don't even directly work with, uh, you know, the snarks people should be using to have a fast prover. Um, and the, the reason the prover is faster with the subject protocol is because it commits to less data. Okay, so to summarize, um, today we use a curve-based snark, uh, sorry, a curve-based commitment scheme uh, in Jolt. Um, it is none, even, even though it uses curves and works over this very big field, very big numbers arise in the protocol, it's still faster than all the other ZKVMs out there 
The reason being that the prover commits to much less data because Jolt uses a centric protocol and um, the other snarks don't. Okay. Um, when if we if we do go to switch Jolt as we plan to to a non elliptic curve based commitment scheme, we will not want to use the commitment schemes people use today because Jolt uses multivariate rather than univariate polynomials. So we'll want to use a commitment scheme that is tailored to multivariate polynomials and moreover um, has, I, I, I think the, the univariate commitment schemes people use today generally are, are worse for the prover, um, you know, slower to commit the data for the prover, um, than, than the ones we, we plan to use. Um, so yeah. Okay. So hopefully that, that makes some sense. We have some explanation for, uh, <laughs> uh, some of what's leading to this confusion.